Hello, my name is Jacqueline Polliff, and today I want to talk about scales on the harp. I don't think scales are as common or as idiomatic as something like a glissando. But they do come up from time to time, so I wanted to talk about them today from a repertoire standpoint. I'm going to play a series of pieces, all featuring scales, and I'll start with the beginning level piece, and then I'll move forward to progressively more difficult music. And if you're playing in a beginning level piece, then you can kind of get an idea of where you start and also where you're headed. But maybe if you're further along the spectrum, you can both get some ideas for where you are right now but how you might go back to practice some easier music if you're having a little bit of difficulty with this technique. And then still, of course, a glimpse of, of where the technique is going down the line. Along the way, I'll talk about a few different practice approaches and tips for scales as well. So the first piece that I wanted to look at is called Album Leaf. It was written by Samuel Milligan, and it comes from his book, Fun from the First, Volume 2. I'm going to play the final section of it for you. I think this is really a nice choice for a beginning student because it's a very straightforward approach to scales. All of the scales are just C major scales, one octave ascending. And to do that, you use a really standard fingering, just four fingers, then you cross under, and another four fingers. For many students who haven't played many scales, the cross under is really the challenging part. And I think if you're working on that, it's great to remember that there's actually two parts to a cross under. The first is swinging your fourth finger under. You could just play five notes to look at that. And what you want to think about is after you, playing the f after you play the first three, uh, swinging your fourth finger under and landing nice and smoothly on the fifth string. So right here, so that your fourth finger is ready and waiting to set up on that fifth string. If the cross under itself is going well, then the next part to think of is what comes immediately after that, getting all of your other fingers set up. So after three strings, you swing your fourth finger under. And then after you play your thumb, you have to add everybody else. So playing everybody else as a group is a great way to check your placing for that. That all of your fingers are just going nicely into the strings, not wobbling around or having to rearrange. I think uh, both of those, the five strings, and then the four strings and four at the same time, are a great starting point for working on scales. Next, I wanted to discuss Sarabond by Ruth K. Englefield. This comes from Solos for Sonia, book two. And like Album Leaf, it can be played on a lever harp. I'd say that it's at about a late beginning level. The piece has many descending scales throughout it. Um, one or two ascending scales, but mostly descending scales. And unlike Album Leaf, which only had eight note scales, there's a lot more variety to the number of notes in these scales. So some have six notes, some have seven notes, some have 10 notes, and so on. So in order to play all of those, you have to use some different fingerings. Rather than just four plus four, you might do three plus four, four plus three, two plus four, all kinds of options. So I'm going to play a bit of the middle section of Sarabond. <laughs> Whenever you have a passage like this where the fingering keeps changing, it's important to mark it really clearly in your music. Um, Englefield has provided a few fingering markings, but maybe not quite in all of the spots where you might want them. Or of course you could just make them bigger too because they're a little bit small <laughs> the way that they're printed in the music. 
And then I think when you're practicing, you want to be really consistent, consistent, making sure that you're always using the same fingering, that you're not changing it up, but that every time, if you're planning to do a three plus three, you do it that way every single time. So this is a great chance to work on some unusual uh, scale groupings. Next, I wanted to look at Andiam Mio Tesoro, which is another piece by Samuel Milligan. Actually, it's an arrangement of an Italian 16th century anonymous work. And this comes from his book, Medieval to Modern, Volume 1. This piece is still playable on a lever harp, but it's a bit more complex, so I'd put it at an intermediate level. As far as scales go, the piece has a lot of scales that are ascending and descending, rather than just moving in one direction. So for that, in addition to crossing under and crossing over, you also have to replace at the top of the scale. When your thumb is all alone, you add your fingers back on and come right back down seamlessly. One interesting thing about scales on the harp is that nothing changes when you change keys. So on other instruments, take the, um, the piano for example, if you change keys, then your scale feels completely different because you're using a different number of black keys and white keys, and all kinds of things can get a lot more complicated <laughs> depending on what key you're in. So this is why most instrumentalists practice their scales in all of the different keys cycling through. But we don't have to do that because um, nothing feels different depending on the key as far as your fingers go. And that's really nice because then you can just focus on these small things, you know, the crossing under, crossing over, replacing, and trying to make all of that really efficient and clean and consistent. So here is a bit of the middle section of Andiam Mio Tesoro. to look at Francois Natterman's first sonatina. This is playable only on a pedal harp rather than a lever harp and um, I'd say it's at an intermediate or late intermediate level. Natterman wrote a set of seven progressive sonatinas so each one gets more complex than the last and all seven of them are great for working on technique. I think he really packs a lot <laughs> into each one. Um, this first sonatina I find is nice for students to check and see how their scales are sort of compared to their overall technique. Um, throughout the piece the scales kind of pop up here and there. There's a lot of arpeggios and frequently the arpeggios and scales are back to back. So a student might be feeling pretty good about their arpeggios on their own and pretty good about their scales on their own, but when you have to do them back to back you can see how they can compare. And sometimes students find that one is a lot more comfortable than the other. And of course, you want them all to feel kind of equally natural. So this can be a great chance to check on that and make sure that your scales are incorporating into your overall technique well. I'm going to play um, a bit of the first part of Natterman's first sonatina in E flat major. <laughs> piece is actually an orchestral excerpt rather than a solo piece. This is The Great Gate of Kiev, written by Modest Mussorgsky and orchestrated by Maurice Ravel, taken from pictures at an exhibition. Uh, this movement is actually written for two harps rather than just one harp, and for this first passage the harps are in unison. So it's an enormous scale, the hands are an octave apart, and it uses the entire range of the harp. So starting on this very highest string, kind of going up and down, eventually landing on the very lowest string and coming back to the middle. I'm just going to play the first part of this passage. So 
there are quite a few sort of twists and turns throughout this, and I think having a really good fingering figured out and marked in and practiced consistently is the first step to playing something like this. Um, another challenge is trying to get everything to be really smooth and to always keep track of where your strong beats are. So to do that, I think you could sort of um, work with different accents placed in different spots purposefully with the end goal of making everything smoother. You could start by just doing accents based on the finger. You could even just take a simple um, uh, one octave scale and say, put an accent on the fourth fingers. And then you could do it again with the accent on the third fingers. And then the second fingers and the thumbs. You could do that for all kinds of passages just to work on a nice even sound between the fingers. But then with something like this where it gets more complex within the measure, if you were to play it and accent the first and um, third beats of each measure, at first that's pretty easy because it matches with your thumbs. But when it starts coming back up, um, the fingering I'm using, then it's accenting your third fingers. And as you go, it keeps moving around to, to more and more different fingers. So then you could try uh, moving your accent just to see if you could do it, putting it maybe on the end of one and the end of three, and so forth and so on, cycling through all of the different places. You could put the accents, which would also match up <laughs> with all of these different fingers. And I think once you've done all of that, you would end up with a really nice, smooth, controlled, and very um, metric version of this passage. So using accents on different fingers and different beats can be a great way to smooth out a scale. The last piece that I wanted to look at today is Fantasy on a Theme of Haydn by Marcel Grangeny. This is playable only on a pedal harp, just like the Mussorgsky and Natterman, and it's written at an advanced level. It's a theme in variations, and the fifth and final variations has a lot of scale work throughout it. Um, it's really kind of a flashy and brilliant variation to end the piece, and so I think the scales are shown in that light. And as with so many pieces, um, getting all the scales really nice and even and smooth in terms of both sound and the length of the note can be challenging. So you could try playing them with some of the accents we were just discussing, maybe accenting um, all of the second fingers. Or you could try doing a intentional rhythm like a long short. or a short long. It always seems kind of counterintuitive that to make things smooth and even, you have to go the other direction first, but it um, does work quite well and it's really common among all instruments. So before I play a little bit of this, I just wanted to say that I hope you've enjoyed um, this discussion of scales and maybe you've gotten some new ideas for repertoire or some approaches to practicing scales. Here is the first part of Grangeny's Fantasy on a Theme of Haydn, Variation Number 5. <laughs> 